Okay, so I'll lecture in English then. I'm Ray Boxman, and our topic today is oral and poster presentations. And uh, the subtitle I like very much is how to make the most of 15 minutes. Typically at a uh, conference, if you have the opportunity to give an oral presentation, you're allocated something between 10 and 20 minutes, 15 minutes being typical. In a very crowded conference, 10 minutes is all you get. And even if you're giving a department seminar, which is nominally an hour, first of all, it's an academic hour, as we know, only 50 minutes, and you have to allow a few minutes for introduction, five or 10 minutes for questions, you really only have 40 minutes. And the problem is that what we really want to do is tell every, everybody everything we've done for a period of four or five years in those 10 minutes. And the question is, how do you do that? The answer is that you don't. And I'm going to tell you what you do do in just a minute. Um, if you need a reference to anything that I say today, first of all, the notes will be posted eventually. And uh, also, there's a textbook. Everything, everything that I'll be saying today, you can find in chapter four of our new textbook, Communicating Science. Here's the link. And the discount code, which I gave you last week, will be valid uh, actually through the end of uh, June, maybe even longer. So there's no panic. If you want to get the book with a discount, the code will still work. So this is our challenge. We have a very, very short time. And we are trying, typically, to describe everything we did in our lifetime in that 10 or 15 minutes. What am I going to try to do in the hour? Here we go. I'm giving you an hour lecture on how to give a 10-minute lecture. What am I trying to do? First of all, what is the objective of giving a lecture or a poster? Just like a paper, it's to transmit information. We want to share with the world the findings of our research. That is our real objective. The truth of the matter is, we also have a secondary objective. We want to impress the audience. We want to impress the audience with the quality of the research. We want to impress the audience with the quality of the researcher. And the reason that Panina is asking me to give this lecture to you is she and the dean and everyone else here wants you to impress your audiences with the quality of your institution, Tel Aviv University. Now, my objective is to give you, if not a recipe, at least some guidelines on how to accomplish this mission. Now, I like to make this analogy that when you give a lecture, it's completely analogous to a multimedia, multi-channel communications channel. I like to do this because I began my professional career as a radio engineer. We have a transmitter, you, in this case, me, a lot of antennae that transmit over different wavelengths and different formats. There's the part that goes at audio frequency, the blah, blah, blah that I'm talking. There's the visual part, namely these slides. There's body language. If I stand up here rigid and just keep talking like this, it conveys one kind of message. And if I gesture a little bit and move around a little bit, it conveys another message. And if I'm really frantic and dancing all around, it probably just confuses the hell out of you. And you may have some additional audiovisual uh, aids. Instead of just uh, passive slides, you may have um, video clips. You may have animations. You may have some three-dimensional model that you bring with you, like, hey, look at my book, or whatever. All of these are basically communications channels which are integrated 
in the receiver, in this case, you, and when you're up here, your audience. The problem is that if you have noise in any of these channels, you increase the error rate for the receiver. We have to keep all of these channels clear. And then we actually get something which is greater than the sum of all its parts. So my objective today, the objective of this, le of this lecture, is to give you some methods and guidelines for presenting good lectures and posters. Here's the outline. We'll talk about lecture preparation, about lecture presentation, about posters, and also how to get the most out of a conference. We'll start with preparation. The first point here is really the key point. You cannot present everything you did for the last two years, or worse yet, the last five years, in 10 minutes. It cannot be done. If you try to do it, you will fail. OK? It will be a waste of time and opportunity. Instead, what you have to do is decide, what is the best story I can tell in the time allotted? You have to choose the material according to the time available. That's the key. You cannot present all of your thesis in 10 minutes. You have to choose maybe the one aspect that's most interesting or most appropriate to present during that opportunity that you have in an oral lecture at a conference. This is really the key thing, choosing material according to the time available. If there's one thing I want you to take home from this lecture, it's really this point. You cannot present two years of work in 10 minutes. It cannot be done. Don't even try. That's not what it's all about. What it's all about is finding 10 minutes, the, most, the 10 most interesting minutes worth of what you did to present. And that, by the way, is very difficult. Okay? Making decisions about what to include means making a lot of decisions about what not to include. And that is simply emotionally difficult. Our work is like our babies. Okay? And Deleting part of our work is like killing one of our children. It's very difficult. But you're not really killing it. You're merely selecting what aspect to present. And you have to think of it in those terms. Next up is to prepare the graphics, the slides, or whatever else you're, you're, you're presenting. And then this is crucial. You have to rehearse. And the rehearsal has to include timing the presentation. And when you discover that it's over time, because you will, you always try to put it too much, then you have to cut excess material. Forget about talking faster. It doesn't work. And even if it does work, the results are worse than if you didn't get up there at all. OK? You have to cut material so that the amount of material is appropriate for the time available. Now, how is the lecture structured? Uh, I've heard it said that a lecture is like a, a concerto. Anyone here like, you know, classical music? In a concerto, there's the presentation, there's the development, and there is the tale, the, the coda. OK? In the first part, you tell the audience what you're going to do. In the second part, you do it. And in the third part, you tell the audience what you did. And that basically works for a lecture as well. We have an introduction in which we're going to tell the audience basically what we're going to tell them. You have the body, where you present the main, you know, the, the development of everything that you want to present. 
And finally, there's some kind of summary where you tell them what you told them. Well, what do we do in the introduction? First of all, about how long is it? It's about 10 to 20 percent of the time allotted. In other words, if you have a 10-minute uh, lecture, one to two minutes should be the introduction. What you want to do is to bring the audience up to speed. You want to make sure that all the audience knows what the hell are you talking about. And this clearly depends on who is the audience. If you're giving a, um, a talk in a breakout section, in a uh, very focused conference, you can pretty much count on everyone in the audience being pretty much in your niche. And the amount of background that you have to give is not very much. On the other hand, if you're giving a, um, uh, a seminar, for example, for the School of Electrical Engineering, which includes uh, people working on plasma, you know, one guy, me, he's already gone, uh, someone's working on antennas and another person is working on um, uh, coding of, uh, of uh, communications messages and someone else is working on microelectronics and somebody else on nanomaterials and somebody else on mesomaterials and somebody else on energy, etc., 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 then that introduction has to be starting at a a point that's sort of the least common denominator. What you want to do is explain what is the overall subject matter. And then you want to tell them what to expect. Where are you going in your lecture? Now all of this is quite brief. 10 to 20 percent of the time allotted. It's not hours and hours. In a 40-minute uh, lecture, it might be five minutes. But it's crucial in terms of getting everybody up to speed, everybody on board. The next is the body. The body of the lecture is very much like the body of a research report. But the emphasis is different. We abbreviate the methodology unless it's novel. We do not have to give all of the details needed to duplicate the results. That criteria does not exist in a lecture. And furthermore, it's impossible. You couldn't possibly give that amount of detail in 10 minutes. You probably need about 30 minutes to do it, and you only have 10 minutes to, to do that and the results. So, you only give a very brief outline of your methodology. You concentrate on the results and their significance. And finally, summary and conclusions. You recap what you told them. You focus on the three points you would like the audience to remember. And what is one of those points? Who was here last week? Who was awake last week? No. We're here in the summary conclusions. Yeah, but what is new? Not what is new. What is the answer to your research question? Okay? It's not so critical that you present a gap in a, uh, in a lecture. You may want to. It's a good idea. But it's not an absolute necessity. But answering the research question, of course, is a necessity. That's why you did the work, was to answer the research question. That's why you're standing up there in front of the, all those people, is to tell them what you found. You found the answer to your research question. Now, what are the most common problems? The biggest problem, the most frequent problem, is trying to present too much material. How many of you, of you have been to either a national or international conference. Okay. How many of you have not seen the little play that goes on with, with always at least one lecturer who gets there 
He's already over time. He still has 18 slides to show. And the uh, chairman of the session is waving at him frankly, three, two, no, OK. Then it's coming over to him, coming over to him. And he doesn't get the hint that he's supposed to end five minutes ago. OK, it used to be in vaudeville, uh, you know, back in the 1920s, when an act would go on too long, the stage manager would come out with a cane that had a, uh, a crooked uh, handle, and they'd yank the guy by the neck and pull him off the, the stage. The chairman of the session really wants to do that, but he doesn't have that cane. And it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing for the chairman. It's embarrassing for all of the audience. Half of the lecturers, however, are absolutely immune to it and feel that they are God's gift to science. And clearly, the fact that they are going into someone else's time is of absolutely no importance because they have more results to show. Anyway, this is the most common problem, and it's one that you absolutely have to avoid. Sort of a, coll a corollary to that is too much detail. Um, a typical conference goes on for a minimum of one whole day, often a whole week. And guess what? By Tuesday afternoon of a whole week conference, people are saturated. They can barely absorb the main message. They're certainly not going to worry about how many bolt holes you had on your flange. Okay? They have no possibility of absorbing detail. So you want to keep detail to the absolute minimum. Just concentrate on the main points. Uh, the third very typical problem is illegible graphics. Words which are too crowded, too small, or just too much detail in the slide. Next problem is insufficient rehearsal. Even I, who, have, who has given this lecture, I don't know, dozens of times, I go over my material before I present it to you. Uh, it's a matter of um, courtesy to your audience, and it's a matter of your own self-pride that you want your delivery to be absolutely smooth. And lastly, uh, various delivery techniques, either verbally, talking too fast, uh, the volume of your voice going down towards the end of the sentence and so no one can hear you, and a couple of other problems, or visual. Um, standing in front of the, um, the slides and blocking it, typically with your back to the audience. OK, let's look at some of the details. First of all, graphics. I think it's a good idea to always present a slide when you're speaking. It focuses the eyes of the audience towards the front of the room. If you just start st talking, they'll be uh, playing with their uh, telephones. They'll be doing that anyway. But they'll be doing it more so if they don't have something to see. Um, and it also helps them lock in to where you are as their mind wanders. And believe me, by Tuesday afternoon, their mind will be wandering a bit. Now, as a rule of thumb, you need about one slide per minute. Now, this depends on you and your slides. This is sort of an average. Uh, it can vary at least 50%, 100% in each direction. In other words, if, if it, they're very simple slides with just a big picture and you don't have to explain the detail, you probably can show two of those slides a minute. And some slides which are very busy, you may need two minutes for a single slide. But as a rule of thumb, it's about one slide per minute. If you have 20 slides in a 10-minute lecture, probably it's not going to work. You must ensure that everything can be read and understood at the back of the room. Best idea? Try it out. 
take your uh, presentation to an empty classroom, present it. Sit in the back of the room and look at each slide. To ensure that, the minimum font that you should be using is 14 points, and that would be for the, um, a, a subscript or superscript. Normal text is about uh, 20 points. Titles, 40 to 60 points. Use color and effects, but uh, sparingly. If you have a slide where every line of text is a different color, it looks like something that my daughter would have prepared when she was 11 years old. It's not professional. But having a different color for the title, uh, using color effectively, like having different curves on a graph be a different color, or different materials in a, um, uh, a diagram of your apparatus, or different colors for different subsystems of your apparatus. All of those make effective use of color. On text slides, we only present key words. No complete sentences. It's just the opposite of what I'd be hammering into your head if I was giving a lecture right at this moment on writing a good paper. In a good paper, everything, just about, except for titles, uses complete sentences, not lecture slides. No complete sentences. You don't want your audience trying to read what's on the slide. They should be listening to you. The slide simply keeps them on topic. It fills in if um, there was a problem and they missed a word or two. Now, don't expect that your graphics will be instantly understood by the audience. Your job is to explain the graphics. In other words, you don't just say, here's my apparatus, go on to the next slide. Okay? That is a waste of a slide a waste of an opportunity, and has conveyed no information. No one could absorb what your apparatus is by flashing it. If you show a graphic, you have to explain it. Let me give an example. Uh, this logo is the logo of my laboratory, the, elect the Electrical Discharge and Plasma Laboratory. We can see that it's composed of the symbol of a cathode and the symbol of the anode, and it shows a vacuum arc propagating from the cathode to the anode, originating at a cathode spot and then expanding as it goes to the anode. On top of the anode is the symbol of Tel Aviv University. I know it's the old symbol, but I like it better than the new one. It shows the flame of learning and the letters Aleph Taf, which stands for both Universita Tel Aviv, and it's also the first letter and last letter of the Hebrew alphabet if you will, the alpha and the omega. Okay, that's what you do. You point to each feature and you explain what it is. It's a good idea to use a slide preparation program like PowerPoint to prepare your slides. By the way, you don't have to take pictures of my slides. They will be posted and the whole lecture will be posted. You should use, if you want to, go ahead, I don't care, but don't need to. Um, you should use their default layouts and formatting and font sizes because it'll come out good. It'll ensure proper spacing. You don't want to crowd your slides. There should be space between items. No workshop drawings. They have too much detail, and the lines are too thin. And please, are there theoreticians in the audience? How many are theoreticians? Please, never present slides that have only equations. 
A, they're boring. B, they cannot be absorbed. Okay? When you flash a slide with 10 equations for 15 seconds, I can tell you precisely what fraction of the audience has actually absorbed those 10 equations. Do you want me to share that number with you? OK. A better idea is to have only one or two equations and explain the equation. Give it a title, conservation of energy. Define the symbols. Make some comments on it. Explain the relevance. Don't just throw out the equations. Never photocopy from books or journals without magnification and emphasis. In fact, better yet, just don't do it. Each slide should have a title. It keeps the audience focused. And you should number your slides, small, down in the quarter. And this is for the sake of your audience who may have a very focused question that relates to a particular slide. They can make a note. Gee, I wonder what he meant by such and such on slide 15. And then he can ask, and you can go back to it. The last slide should be something interesting, an interesting graphic or the summary, not just thank you. OK? That's kind of boring and missing, missing the point. Here is a sample text slide from a lecture. OK, just what's in the box here. Everything around here is just to explain. So it has a title. And the title are big letters, in this case, 44. And it should be a uh, dark color. The background should be white. Colored, even lightly colored, uh, lecture slides are harder for the audience to read, particularly if the room isn't very dark, if there's stray light. If you have a logo, make sure it's reasonably small, and it should either be on the side or the bottom. The body text is only bullet points, OK? Keywords, no complete sentences. Uh, in this particular slide, the main uh, bullet points are 32 points, and the subsidiary ones are 28 points. OK? Big size if you want it to be readable. And like I mentioned, have a number in the corner. A typical graphic slide, again, should have a title and a light background. And the, the graphic, whether it's a graph or a photograph, should take up almost all of the room of the slide, except for the title. Even if it overlaps uh, the logo or the uh, slide number. Everything that's on the slide must be visible and readable in the back of the room. Now, this is a slide that has a slide, so maybe you can't read the numbers here. But if it was full size, you could. This means that if you're using something like um, um, Excel to generate your graphs, you have to go into it a little bit and not use their defaults. Their defaults are too damn small. Okay, I mean, they're fine for viewing on the computer. Uh, where you're in control and you can make it bigger or smaller, whatever you want, but not for your lecture slides. You have to go into, in there and enlarge it. Um, it's good practice to use the principle of heads-up display that we described last week. For example, here it gives the conditions. This is the uh, an etalon transmission curve. And uh, it gives the conditions here that these are 
with, a, with an empty etalon and 10 ohm reflectors. Likewise, the various curves should be labeled. So, for example, here is T in decibels, and here is T without, you know, just fraction, T being the transmission. And, of course, the two axes are labeled, and the units are, are given. Any questions here? Okay, what about presentation? They say in real estate, not run, that there are three important issues that determine the value of a property. Location, location, and location. When you give a lecture, there are three important elements to, to ensure that it goes well. Rehearse, rehearse, and rehearse. You should rehearse initially in front of a mirror, all by yourself. But be sure that you also rehearse in front of your colleagues. In my lab, it was the practice that anyone who was giving a lecture at a conference first gave it at a group meeting. You want to get the feedback from your colleagues before you go and present it someplace halfway across the world. Make sure someone is using a stopper to check the time. And then when you find that, in fact, you have too much material and you are over time, you go back and do your homework and cut out material. I recommend that when you present a lecture at a national or international conference, more so an international than a national, that you wear business attire. That means for the gentleman, suit and tie. For the women, there's more options, but in my opinion, it should be conservative but feminine. Yes? Okay, a good suggestion. I'll repeat it so that it'll go on to the haklata. Um, if when you rehearse in front of colleagues, get someone to record it, and in particular to record the feedback that you get from your colleagues, because you don't always remember it. Good idea. At the conference, upload your file to the podium computer before the session begins. These, this is the usual instructions that are given, but there's always someone who comes with the last minute because they were still working on their presentation um, five minutes ago, and uh, waste time uploading it there. Now, an interesting point is, well, should I do that or should I bring my own computer? It's better to use the podium computer. It's all set up. Someone has done all of the arrangements that have to be made. The one problem is that you've got to make sure that everything works. If you're just using a PowerPoint presentation, plain vanilla, no animations or clips, there shouldn't be any problem. The real problem is, is if you have embedded material. You've got to upload it enough ahead of time that you can check, you know, actually run through the presentation and make sure that all of the embedded material is still embedded and is still available. Usually what you have to actually do is upload to the directory where your presentation will be all of the embedded material, all of the source files. It's usually a good idea not to use the PPT format, but rather, what do they call it? 
PPS, I think. Um, the slideshow format. The chances that that will work well on somebody else's computer are greater, but still you have to check it. And you should have a backup plan if it doesn't work. I mean, either do without the embedded material or uh, go out of your presentation and into the embedded material. Whatever you need to do, have a backup plan for it. It's probably going to take more time, so you're going to have to, on the fly, cut material. Now, I strongly recommend using the mouse for pointing. I suggest that you keep the cursor visible. If you do a right click, you get this thing called pointer options. And if you go to pointer options, um, either choose the laser pointer, which is what I'm doing, or go to arrow options and choose the option that's called visible. Where did it go? Second one down here. Okay? I'm not going to do it now because I prefer the so-called, what happened to it? Laser pointer, which I just seem to have lost. Hold it, let's get it back here. Here we go. Uh, because people are used to looking at a, a laser. But don't use a laser. Um, the laser pointers are annoying. The dot is always flickering. To use it, you have to turn your back to the audience. Here, here's a, a whole comparison of why you should not use one of these things. And let me just demonstrate. This is your typical lecture. He's standing here with his back to the audience. You get to see the worst part of my aspect, namely the bald part of my head, okay? And keep it in mind that uh, I'm a marksman. You know, I, I go take the rifle. I just get bullseyes. This is how study I can keep the, the laser pointer on target. Even so, it's wandering around and it's annoying you. Most people, when they do it, this is what they do, you know. <laughs> The, I, I mean, it's just, just terrible. Uh, furthermore, it has laser speckle, which is annoying. Okay? This dot has no, has no speckle at all. It's perfect. If you go, uh, if you're giving a, a lecture in a, you know, a keynote lecture in a big uh, auditorium, often they'll have multiple screens. If you're using your mouse is your pointing device, no problem. It'll go onto all of the screens. It even goes onto this recording perfectly. Okay? But if you're using you know, one of these lasers, well, which screen are you going to point it at? You can only point it at one. Everybody paid the same registration fee, whether they're sitting where they can see the one that you're pointing at or a different one. It's not fair. And then furthermore, the mouse or some pointing device is going to be there on the computer. This thing can walk away. I'm putting it in my pocket so I remember to give it back to have a bite. When I got to here, I had to go scrounging around for one. There wasn't one here. The key point is that I think it's important when you give a lecture to face the audience and make eye contact. When you give a lecture, you look at somebody and you see that he's looking back. And it makes a big difference. The audience psychologically connects better, okay, when you're looking, in, looking at them in the eye. And when you're looking at them in the eye, you can go over and when someone is falling asleep, you can give them a little kick. <laughs> you can't do that if you have your back to the audience. Okay. So you not only want to look at the audience, but you want to speak to the audience. You don't want to read your lecture. The cadence of your voice is completely different when you read than when you speak. 
Frankly, it's boring. Not only that, but it puts people to sleep. It's monotonous. Um, half the people are going to fall asleep in your lecture anyway, particularly if it's already Wednesday. Okay, they're had it up to here already with lectures. Um, if you read a lecture, it's more like 95%. You want to speak slowly and clearly and use simple words. Take it into account that for all practical purposes, all conferences are international conferences. Uh, even if you're giving a conference, uh, giving a presentation at a conference in Israel, you're probably going to be presenting it in English. And um, probably a very small fraction of the audience has English as their native language. You're probably going to be speaking in a language which is not your native language, and most of the people listening. It's also not their native language as well. So use simple words. I mentioned before, maintain eye contact with the audience. I've mentioned before also to point to the relevant items on your slides. If you point to what line you're at, people know where you're at and they can key in better. And when you point to the symbol of Tel Aviv University, they're right there with you. And then, again, don't drop your voice at the end of uh, sentences. Here's a little slide to illustrate what I mean. This is what you want. When you come to the end of a sentence, you stop. You maintain the amplitude up to that stopping point. Now, what happens when you get to the end of the sentence and you get to a period is that actually the frequency, your pitch, drops. Falling frequency is the sign of a period in verbal English. In contrast, if you raise the tone of voice at the end of a sentence, it indicates a question. How old are you? Okay? When you, get, when you say that sentence, your, the frequency actually rises. Um, this works for all speakers of English except New Zealanders. They tend to end all of their sentences as if they're question marks for the rest of the English-speaking world. Anyone here from New Zealand? Thank goodness. Okay. Any questions about the lecture before I go on to the poster? Okay. Posters. First of all, I like posters. I think they're a wonderful invention. Um, but they have to be done properly to be effective. First of all, the organizers of the conference have to do things right in order for that to happen. The two things that they have to do is, first of all, not treat posters as second-class papers. There should be the, exactly the same criteria for accepting all papers to the conference, the same scientific criteria. You choose the oral presentations on the basis of, A, um, the amount of interest that there is apt to be in that presentation, and B, on the ability of the presenter to make a good oral presentation. But all the scientific criteria ought to be the same. The other key for success at the level of organizing a conference, and I say this to all of you because probably someday you will be organizing some conference, is you put the refreshments next to the posters. Okay? If that bottle of beer or cup of tea or bag of munchies is right there by the posters, the people will go to the posters, and they'll be happy. Now, we use the poster in two ways, for two kinds of visitors. 
The first is as a, an important use, is as a backdrop for one-to-one -one conversations with truly interested colleagues. This is why posters are a wonderful thing, because you can have this detailed um, discussion with somebody who is really interested in your work. The other use is for the walk by curious. We have to take him in mind when we design the poster, but that is the least important use of the poster. Now the structure of the poster is similar to a lecture. It has an introduction, it has a body, it has a summary or conclusion. What you should never do, never ever, is post a copy of your paper as a poster. It is an absolute waste of time. Um, maybe one in a thousand will even break the, 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 uh, the rate of which they're walking in order to look at such a presentation. Who the hell wants to read a paper like this? You want to read the paper, it's in the proceedings anyway, sitting down, maybe laying down, maybe in the beach, maybe sitting on the toilet, I don't know, but the last place you want to do it is standing like this. Gives you a stiff neck, and there are better uses for your time at a conference. So just don't ever do that. Now, the guidelines for making up the graphic, making up the poster, are similar to what you do in a lecture. But there's a couple of changes because it's really focused at the few who are interested. And for those few who are really are interested, you have more time available. You can show equations if you need them to discuss your work with experts. You can have more detail if you're there to explain it. You can also have with you 3D, 3D objects, you know, something like this, okay, samples, um, even your laptop or your uh, mobile phone with a video clip and show it to just the guys who are interested. Now here's a sample poster uh, in order to illustrate a few points. First thing, background. You want a light color or white. I think white is actually better. Large title something on the order of 77 points. By the way, you should do this up also in PowerPoint or some other program designed for the purpose. It should have an abstract, but no complete sentences. The points that you want to make in the abstract are bullet pointed. Just keywords. Main headings are big, like about 44 points. All of the text is also just bullet points, no complete sentences. And present your conclusions also in bullet points. Now a little bit about how do you actually present the poster, poster conduct. First of all, be next to the poster when it's required. The whole idea, the wonderful thing about a poster is that it's a meeting point to discuss your work with people who are really interested. If you're not standing there next to the poster, that doesn't happen. You've got to be there. You want to use the poster as a backdrop to discuss your work with the maybe two or three or five or ten people in this enormous conference who are really interested in what you did. <coughs> well, how do you know who those people are? Well, you might know because you've read their papers and you make it a point to 
grab them some to at some point during the conference and invite them to your poster. You tell them when and where it is. But you might not know. People are walking by. What do you do? I suggest that you actively engage people. Uh, I need a volunteer. Can I have a volunteer? Someone volunteer? Please, come up here. Let's make pretend that here's our poster, OK? And you come walking by. There's an expression in English that's called buttonholing. Now, he's not wearing a shirt that has buttonholes. But if he did, like my shirt, it's grabbing the person by the buttonhole. That's called buttonholing someone. You don't let him go. Now, I don't mean that literally, uh, particularly since not everyone has buttonholes anymore. And you can get in trouble these days, I think. It's a little bit too intimate. But the idea is someone comes by, and here he is, and you say, may I explain my work to you? You don't wait for his answer, OK? You have prepared a three-minute speech that summarizes your poster. Okay, you say, let me go back to my poster here. What I did in this poster is um, characterize the electrical field of a plasma when it's energized by a microwave field. Here, I can, this is the apparatus over here. I put the magnetron on the top and it had a uh, circular antenna, which produces a circularly polarized wave uh, that's in the azimuthal direction. And what we found is that you, know, you give them the whole speech, three minutes. You don't take no for an answer. OK, thank you. You can sit down. Now, if af after giving this poor guy the three minute speech, if he's really interested, he'll start asking questions. And then you can continue on ad infinitum. Okay? Or at least until someone else comes by. The point is you don't stand there passively. <laughs> someone comes by, engage them. Okay? Go forward towards them and explain. Don't wait for them to ask questions. Now. Let me end up here with how to get the most out of a conference. First of all, what's the purpose of going to a conference? I have a secret to tell you. It's not to hear the lectures. The real, because you can read the proceedings. You can read the papers. They'll have far more information. The real objective of a conference is to meet your colleagues for informal discussion. The lectures and posters, et cetera, et cetera, is merely a structure to facilitate this. The most important session of the conference is the coffee break. That's where all of the real work of the conference goes on. The coffee break, the dinner, the other informal uh, activities that may or may not be part of the conference itself. This is where you make contacts for jobs, for future cooperation and collaboration. And it's also where you learn what isn't in the formal papers and lectures. What I call black magic, the tricks that the guy did to actually make the experiment work. And he doesn't write them because they're too stupid. Like he had to kick the damn uh, microwave uh, magnetron three times, otherwise it didn't work. He's not going to write that down, but he might tell you. His doubts, when he's presented his so-called typical results, how typical were they really? And what he's presenting at the conference formally is what he's already done. What you really want to know is what is he going to do next week, next month, next year? Informal discussions can often bring that out. He may be happy to share where he's going. Now, if you can't attend a conference that you've registered for and you are supposed to present a poster or even worse, an oral paper, 
notify the conference organizers as much in advance as possible. It's common courtesy. And if you don't, your name is Mud. What every conference organizer hates is what is called no-shows. People who have been assigned a slot in the program and are not there to fill that slot. Make it a point to introduce yourself to colleagues who you'd like to meet, even senior colleagues. Okay? Go up to them, introduce yourself, tell them how much you like their work. Engage them in a conversation, but do it politely, don't be a pest. If the guy is chatting away with his friends, grab him at a, a better opportunity. Standing by the urinal in the bathroom is a good place. During the discussion period after a lecture, do ask questions. I should say, ask one question. Don't monopolize uh, the discussion. If you have a follow-up question, ask it in the coffee break. That's what the coffee break is for. But utilize these coffee breaks, meals, evenings, visits to uh, cultural or scientific uh, uh, locations out of the conference to meet your colleagues and to chat up these guys who you don't normally see. Avoid hanging around with your clique. I can't tell you how many times I go to a conference and I can find all the Israelis. They're easy to find because they're all standing together, talking with each other. They could get together for lunch anytime they wanted to in Tel Aviv. They're no more than an hour apart from any other university. But they go 7,000 miles away to do it in San Diego. I don't understand it. Don't do it. If you see another Israeli, wave to him and then turn around and go the other way. Okay? Business cards. Uh, I have a secret. I print my own business cards. Every time I've had, it, had them printed by the university, Without fail, within six weeks, some detail has changed. My office has changed, my title has changed, uh, my phone number changes. So I just do it myself. Laser printer, it comes out beautiful. You can do it too, for yourself. Okay? You should have business cards. There's a bit of um, protocol uh, when you give a business card to anyone from East Asia, China, Japan, etc. And you should know the protocol. You present the business cards with two hands. You present it in the direction that they can read it. Okay? And when you accept a business card, you accept it with two hands, and you look at it, you read it. And then you either put it in your breast pocket, okay, or in a card case. Never in your back pocket. Okay? So, let me summarize. You have to transmit information in the best way suited for the audience. And you have to take into account the audience's limitations. Remember that most of your audience are going to be closer to my age than your age. Which means they don't see so well, they probably don't hear so well, and they have a big tendency to fall asleep. Okay? Keep that in mind. That means that you have to speak loudly, you have to speak clearly, you have to speak slowly, and you have to keep things moving along so that they don't fall asleep. You need clear graphics that are readable from the back of the room. You need to speak slow and loud. And most important of, of all is you have to stay on time. You have to rehearse your material with a stopper, in front of an audience, and make sure that you can complete it on time, even when you're nervous. And that means not talking fast, but having the right amount of material. And finally, make a good impression, both for yourself and for Tel Aviv University. That's it. Any questions?
The question is, should the titles of the slide, what you have up here on the top of the slide, correspond to what's in the outline? Yes and no. Okay? When you are starting a new section of the talk, part of the title should include the title of that section. Okay? So that the audience knows where you're at. But you want every slide to be labeled. You may have four parts to the, uh, uh, to the lecture, but 15 slides. So they're not all going to correspond. You certainly don't want to present an outline that has 15 lines in it because no one can absorb that much information. That's too much detail for them to absorb. So it's yes and no. Other questions? Okay, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Good luck. <laughs>